So I was remembering about this business that was in my country. Um, they had this building right here. Uh, and uh, not building, they would sell furniture. They would have restaurants. Um, they would sell lamps. It was an awesome place. They had a, a restaurant called The Golden Guitar. And the whole bar was like a huge guitar. And they had like the best food. And I don't know, it was really cool for that time. Um, but the interesting part is how this whole thing got started. It was done by a woman. And my dad... He was the accountant of this woman and all she had was like two little huts and she would serve food there and um, she saved her money and she bought the rest of the land and I think back then buying land was like buying a dot com because from the dot com you can do a lot of stuff right um, you can do a lot of business out of, out of a name which is like a piece of real estate on the internet well she had that and then start building that center building here and uh, she hired an architect and she built it up and then she figured she needed he needed people to put to work if she wanted to put a bigger restaurant now so for some reason she went to the other side of the country to Merida and I think she hired a lot of people from there because they were from another place where they were doing much rougher work so they would appreciate coming to work for a restaurant. Interesting recruiting technique. So she brings them and then she figures out that she doesn't want to be paying them money so that they travel to a place and stuff. So she built like housing for them. So she started creating like a campus. And she said she could control them. And then this building, this starts to grow and then she starts to sell furniture. And then she figures out that she could be fixing her own furniture and not paying anybody else so she built like um like a carpenter shop back there and she will, would also fix stuff anyway a really brilliant woman really amazing story and her sister was here and now they got like a gas station and it's amazing that someone who figured out that she needed to have control to be self-sufficient to grow her business. It's amazing that she doesn't have a web page. She doesn't. And I bet that if she's having trouble selling her product right now, and she figured out that she doesn't have to just sell it to people in Venezuela, that she could be doing business online and you know, having a shop that sells furniture anywhere and then they just freaking charge for shipping from elsewhere. Like she knows she knows the business, right? She could be bringing furniture straight to, to the United States. She doesn't even have to bring it over here. She just know she just gets the customers. But she's not aware of this. Nobody has gone there. And all I can find about this place is uh, the the yellow pages. Anyway, so I was looking for this. It took me quite a while to find it. And as I went there, uh, this is the the roundabout when you enter my old city where I used to live. And in San Antonio and then you get out of here and you know that there's this motel here like where people go to fuck I never went there and I'm looking at this and this is where this video gets interesting I see what the fuck is this right here it looks like a, I don't know, a huge huge fucking chemical complex it's like wow dude you are banking it in the middle of these freaking mountains in the jungle you know look so I, f I, I do a search for Cotinge and Co. S.A. And uh, I find their website. They do have a website. So let's search them for you. Cotin Iron and Co. Cotin and Co. Something like that. This one, it says hacked by somebody. Somebody hacked them. But then I'm just gonna read you this, and I'm gonna try to translate into English the, the the story of this company. You know, like how the hell did that factory end up there? Well, we get to be lucky enough to find that story 
out of all stories in the world. We can find the story of that factory in the middle of a mountain somewhere in Venezuela, something really anonymous, and it's quite an, an amazing story. I bet something like this would, would be, you know, like on the news if it had happened in the United States in Silicon Valley. Um, so I think these guys were amazing. So it's this dude that uh, came from this guy called Rodolfo Coutin. So he's a guy from Belgium, goes to Venezuela in the 50s, lo looking for better life in the 50s, 1950. So around 1953, he starts... Uh, she, he goes to this place which is sucks now it's called El Cementerio in Caracas and uh, he, he, he started working with a small shoe store there that's how he started and then from there he rent and two years later he saves some money so check this out every two years uh, so two years later he rents a garage in a house that's nearby and then he starts making shoe like the glue for shoes uh, with some machinery that he just bought from the guy that used to sell the shoe glue to him. So he bought glue from somebody and eventually he made so much money. He's like, hey, can I buy you that machine? Because for some reason he, he didn't want to have that expense, I suppose. So by trying not to have that expense, look what happens. So look at the power of being self-sufficient and of, you know, then working from there forward, which is the law of accelerating returns. I think this, this is a great example. So immediately he put the machines and then in two years later, with his cousin, they get a, a license with a German company called Izar Chemi. So these guys, back then there's no internet, it's 57 in Venezuela. They must have traveled after a very expensive phone call probably to Germany. And, uh, you know, being European, probably they had the contacts, you know, from other people in Europe. So they go, and that same year, since they need more space, then they get three freaking, um, what do you call these? Like these huge places where you store shit. I forget. Like in the place where you pick up your, your Ikea stuff at the end of the shop. Like huge Galpon, I don't know how to say it in English. I forgot. So next year, they start producing um, something called Izar Coal uh, with the same, you know, the same company they got the license from. And by the end, they register officially the the factory like Kutain, like it's called now. That's fifty eight. So it's been only five years, and this guy went from selling shoes to having a glue factory. Five years now 64 comes you know it's a little while now the 60s and you know what I I want to have the I want to make the containers of my own glue he makes that simple decision you know we shouldn't just be selling glue you know we should be making also the the cover so by doing that he starts he becomes <laughs> um, a manufacturer of um, of metal um, containers, you know, like for for glue and for paint. So they start becoming like very self-sufficient company. And then they start getting more licenses. You know, once they got all these industrial physical thing, they they I I, I can see like the licenses being like getting code <laughs> uh, from another you know like, like paid source code because there's no open source code. So they get this license from sending that to chemicals and they start doing resins and then after that they buy some machinery from Switzerland to polymerize vinyl and acetato acetate I don't know how you call that in English and then it's 1970 and they buy this land in 1970 they bought this there was nothing here in 1970 and four years later they finish building the whole infrastructure just four years and by 75, they got the entire operation there. It's like, boom, we finished. In one year, we are going to move everybody. These guys were fucking business. They, they didn't waste any time. 1982, they get a, a license from a Dutch company. And they start producing anti-corrosive painting. So these guys could do whatever the fuck they want. I bet they had like really, really talented engineers and chemists, chem, um, chemists working for them. Um, 
and they were growing, you know, nobody's messing with them. Try doing that, that now in Venezuela with Hugo Chavez, that's impossible. He's gonna take your business apart. It will make everything happen so that it's really hard for you to produce your product, sell it or distribute it. Then, anyways, they become this huge freaking painting factory and by 1995, they are producing 600,000 uh, gallons of paint, paint like, and then in 98, uh, they're already making a million gallons a year of paint. That's, I think, crazy. And all of these stories are pretty much freaking next to each other. Like right here is an amazing story and right here is, so I bet there's another story here. And wherever you see this, you know, developments, you know, this, somebody had to freaking have the balls to build this shit and sell it, you know? And behind that, there's always a great story. So I think, you know, the story of the, the small business, <laughs> because that's a small business if you compare it to like the big business, are really amazing. And, and they're the ones that employ people and, and feed families. And it's really cool. I think entrepreneurs, and, and, I mean, oh, and the best part of this lady, she never went to school. She never had a like high school or anything, but she could figure out, you know, interest and businesses. And so otherwise she would have been fucked. You know, like she would, you know, get in debt, but she would figure out that she's not going to get in trouble with the right rates and stuff. Like this woman figured out numbers naturally. So amazing. Um, so anyway, if if anybody from her family ever hears this, I, I, I appreciate it. She helped my mother pay a lot of my tuition when I was in school and we couldn't afford it. So that's pretty fucking amazing. Um, she also helped me get out of there. I guess that's all I have.